Then each video would play individually, starting with a tail boom camera from Spaceship Two, then the ground-based video, then the pylon camera from White Knight Two. The videos are stopped before Spaceship Two breaks up. We'd like to take a moment to pause to see if anyone would like to leave the room before the video is shown. Telemetry data show that the feather moved even though we know from the cockpit image recording that neither pilot had deployed the feather. However, the cockpit video did show that the co-pilot had unlocked the feather just after point eight Mach. Per the test card, the co-pilot was to unlock the feather when Spaceship Two reached a speed of 1.4 Mach. This was to allow the vehicle time to transition through the transonic region. Since the feather was unlocked in the transonic region, aerodynamic and inertial loads imposed on the feather flap assembly overcame the feather actuators, and the feather extended uncommanded, causing the catastrophic structural failure. Range instrumentation radar located on Edwards Air Force Base tracked White Knight 2 with Spaceship 2 attached and Spaceship 2 itself following its release from White Knight 2 until the impact of Spaceship Two's main oxidizer tank and wings with the ground. The telemetry data ended during the breakup. During the breakup sequence, the pilot was thrown from the vehicle while still restrained in his seat. During his descent to the ground, the pilot released himself from his seat and his parachute deployed automatically. The pilot's seat and parachute were found separately. The top middle of the slide shows where the left and right tail booms landed and the cockpit and nose and the rocket motor were located towards the bottom left of the Duties slide. Duties were divided between pilot and co-pilot. Each pilot memorized his task due, the due to the dynamic nature of the boost portion of flight. After release from White Knight 2, the pilot was responsible for vehicle control and would command fire to which the co-pilot was to ignite the rocket motor. At a speed of 0.8 Mach, the co-pilot was to verbally call the speed to alert the pilot to expect the transonic bobble. The transonic bobble is a nose up and then a nose down motion of the vehicle that occurs due to aerodynamic forces resulting from a shift in the center of lift and becoming supersonic. No physical action was required by either pilot. As the vehicle became supersonic, the pilot was to trim the horizontal stabilizers and the co-pilot was to assist the pilot by verbalizing the stabilizer trim position. Finally, at 1.4 Mach, the co-pilot was to move the feather lock handle to the unlock position. Only the physical action was required. There was no required call out of the speed. Preparation for PFO4 began in January 2014. To learn the procedures and ensure proficiency, SCALE took a three-pronged approach to training Spaceship Two pilots. The Spaceship Two simulator, the White Knight Two aircraft, and the Extra 300 aerobatic airplane. The Spaceship Two simulator was a fixed base, no motion simulator that replicated the Spaceship Two cockpit layout. The simulator was used by the pilot and co-pilot to practice running through the test card and non-normal procedures, as well as to conduct full mission rehearsals with the entire mission team. Spaceship Two pilots also trained using White Knight Two as its cockpit layout was designed similarly to the Spaceship Two cockpit and in certain configurations, White Knight 2 had a similar flight path and descent profile as Spaceship 2, which simulated glide through touchdown. 
Finally, Spaceship Two pilots received aerobatics training in the Extra 300, which included G-tolerance and upset recovery training. Scaled required Spaceship Two pilots to complete at least three full mission rehearsals, three simulated approaches in White Knight Two, and three aerobatic training flights in the Extra 300 to prepare for Spaceship Two powered flight. In addition to training, SCALED performed several flight readiness reviews before PFO4. In addition to the test team reviewing the vehicle configuration and any changes for the flight, the intent of these meetings was to get management buy-in on the risks that the team had identified and to determine potential unidentified risks through the use of independent subject matter experts. SCALED also held a town hall meeting to provide the team the opportunity to ask unanswered questions and to discover unknown issues that could delay the remaining Spaceship 2 program schedule. There were no items discussed at these meetings for PFO4 that were related to pilot procedures for the feather system. Stressors were present during the boost phase of flight that likely contributed to the co-pilot unlocking the feather prior to 1.4 Mach. As previously mentioned, the co-pilot memorized his three tasks to be accomplished during this phase, calling out 0.8 Mach, calling out the stabilizer position in degrees, and unlocking the feather at 1.4 Mach. In addition to recalling these tasks from memory, each of the tasks needed to be accomplished in a limited time frame, less than 26 seconds according to post-accident simulator tests. If the feather was not unlocked by 1.8 Mach, the flight was to be aborted. Scale designed a caution message to illuminate on the center multifunctional display along with an oral enunciation at 1.5 Mach as a reminder to the crew if the feather was not unlocked by that speed. Because of the importance of unlocking the feather before 1.8 Mach, the co-pilot might have been anxious to unlock the feather to avoid aborting the flight. Another stressor during the boost phase was the operational environment specifically the vibration and loads experienced with the rocket motor ignited. The vibrations and loads experienced during powered flight were not replicated in the simulator, and the co-pilot had not flown Spaceship 2 under power since powered flight 1 in April 2013. Although the pilots received G-tolerance training prior to the flight, pilots were not required to perform any mission-related tasks other than to demonstrate vehicle control during this training. The lack of recent experience with powered flight vibration and loads could have increased the co-pilot stress and thus his workload during a critical phase of flight. Scaled composites did not emphasize human factors in the design, operational procedures, simulator training, or hazard analysis for Spaceship 2. During the design of Spaceship 2, Scale did not consider the possibility that a pilot would un unlock the feather before 1.4 Mach and as such, no safeguards were built into the feather system design to prevent this. Although Spaceship 2 program personnel said they were aware that unlocking the feather during transonic flight would be catastrophic, there was no warning, caution, or limitation in the Spaceship 2 pilot operating handbook or on the PFO4 test card that specified this risk. The only documented discussions about the loads on Spaceship 2's tail occurred more than three years before the accident in an email and a PowerPoint presentation. AST was also not informed of this hazard. In addition, human factors was not fully considered in Spaceship 2 training as the simulator did not replicate the vibration and loads, nor did pilots train wearing the same flight gear that they were expected to wear during actual flights in the vehicle. Finally, Scales hazard analysis did not consider pilot-induced hazards that could pose a, p a risk to public safety. This area will be discussed more in Mr. Hoff's presentation. By not considering unlocking early in the boost phase as a potential cause of an uncommanded feather extension, scaled missed opportunities to identify design and or operational factors that could have mitigated the catastrophic consequences of this single human error. Although scaled engineers reference some military standards and FAA circulars, because commercial spaceflight is an emerging industry, no human factors guidance currently exists specifically for commercial space operators. Staff has proposed recommendations in this area.